watching Canadian Muslim News on Muslim Network TV from Toronto, Ontario. This is Samia Sayed. Welcome back to the show. Coming up very shortly is a conversation with Dr. Carrie Bowman, a professor of bioethics and global health, on the latest COVID-19 updates. But first, let's take a look at some headlines. Risk of political polarization in Canada, report suggests. RCMP charges man with terrorism hoax. Migrant man found dead on Canadian border. Human Rights Watch head loses Harvard Fellowship. And now the details. Canada is facing a similar risk of political polarization that has been affecting American politics, reports a U.S.-based research group. In the annual report titled Top Risk by Eurasia Group published Tuesday, global political instability affecting Canada, Japan and Brazil are treated separately. According to the report, Canada, however, does not make it to the top 10 countries facing geopolitical or instability risks. The president of the research group says the biggest threat to Canadian politics faces is the continued infiltration of toxic culture from across the border. The report calls Russia the world's most top rogue country. A man who was arrested by Canadian police for making threats on Twitter and later released will appear on January 18th at the Ottawa Provincial Court. According to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, 19-year-old Daniel Howd from Ottawa made death and terrorism-related threats targeting Parliament Hill and the Department of Defence. Howd also threatened the Embassy of the People's Republic of China and the Embassy of the United States of America. The RCMP says it was made aware of the threats in early November. Howd is facing charges of a terrorism hoax, uttering a threat against a person and uttering a threat to destroy property. A migrant man has been found dead yesterday near Roxham Road, Quebec. The area is an unofficial border between the United States and Canada and is often used by migrants to claim asylum. Quebec's provincial police force confirmed the death yesterday morning. It is not clear how the man died. U.S. Customs and Border Protection agents first spotted the body via helicopter on the Canadian side and alerted Canadian officials. A spokesperson for Quebec's provincial police force says they are trying to determine the identity of the deceased man. They are also trying to find where he was coming from and where he was headed. A fellowship offer from the Harvard Kennedy School in the U.S. to Kenneth Roth, the former head of the Human Rights Watch, has been rescinded, reports a U.S. magazine. The decision that Roth's fellowship has been cancelled was communicated to him back in July. Allegedly, Douglas Elmendorf, the school's dean, cited a supposed anti-Israel bias in Roth's tweets as a significant reason for the decision. According to the U.S. magazine, Roth has a Jewish background. He was drawn to human rights work from his father's experiences living in Nazi Germany. Roth terms the incident, quote, crazy. He has since accepted a visiting fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania. And that's it for the news. Now the latest wave of COVID-19 news and headlines features a new subvariant XBB 1.5, otherwise known as the Kraken, and new travel restrictions and measures, and a waning interest in getting vaccinated among Canadians. Joining us now to share more on the latest is Carrie Bowman, an associate professor at the University of Toronto's Temerty Faculty of Medicine. Welcome to the show, Carrie, and thank you so much for joining us today. Happy to be here. Carrie, there is a new subvariant out there, XBB 1.5. Now, there have been a few cases in Canada, not nearly as much as reported in the US, but is this new subvariant a cause for concern? Well, we don't know, but you know, generally, and I, I, I'm following the information on this, not as an epidemiologist, but but you know, just following it closely. Yes, it's absolutely in Canada. We have at least 20 cases, but look, reality is we probably have a whole lot more than that. Please remember, this is Omicron again, right? Now, there's no indication that this is more severe, uh, but these are early days, but it is worth keeping an eye on. It does seem to be, you know, moving quite quickly, and it is something worth keeping an eye on, but there's no indication that illness is more severe. 
In light of this new variant, the government has put in new travel restrictions, such as requiring a negative test for travelers from China, Hong Kong, and Macau. Do you think this was the right move? I don't. I don't. And here's why. I mean, we've learned through the pandemic that pre-departure testing and, and even arrival testing really has not been that useful. I'm not speaking of the first few months of the pandemic, but I'm speaking, you know, we're, we're well into it now, as we know. But, but this really has not been the most efficient method because people can test positive at a later point. But, you know, the good news is things are changing very quickly. So, for example, um, in Canada now, at the, at the major airports of both Vancouver and um, Toronto, there will be wastewater testing. So what that means is, is a flight, and this will be on flights from China. So this is actually a very progressive, it's not a perfect system, nothing is perfect. It, it's got a few flaws, but, but you know, and we need more of it. But here's what happens, a plane arrives from China, or anywhere, but in this case, China, uh, there's no interruption to passengers in any way, shape or form. And the wastewater um, is then tested from that, including genomic sequencing to see if, um, you know, Omicron, uh, COVID and look, other things as well, other illnesses as well uh, might be coming in. I'm not suggesting this would prevent things from coming in, but it could tell us if there's something new to keep an eye on or, or the volume of, you know, the frequency of illness coming in. So it's, it's a very good thing. And I'm very hopeful, as are many Canadians, that in the, in the weeks and months ahead, uh, wastewater testing will be expanded throughout our country. And, and become a much more uh, you know, prevalent way of assessing things. And please remember to all of us that travel, which is an awful lot of us, this does not interfere with our travel in any way, shape or form. Now, on the note of travel restrictions, you told a media outlet, and I quote, that this was a political move and not based on science. What did you mean? Well, you know, we began with the United States, um, you know, President Joe Biden, and then, you know, and then Canada sort of went back and forth, and then Britain went back and forth. And, and I think it feels like the right thing to do, because China has now, you know, there's 8 billion people on the planet Earth now at, since November, or that's obviously the estimate. Uh, 1.4 billion of those people are, are in the People's Republic of China. So it's, it's a lot of people. And it feels like the right thing to do that, you know, why don't we just test? Because what if something else is going on in China that we don't know about? Um, but look, it's not that effective. And I would say it is political. We're doing it because the Americans are doing it. And now Britain's doing it. The European Union's fairly ambivalent. And here's what I worry about. I, I worry that, you know, when we get into these divisions between us and them, you know, early in the pandemic, there was a lot of emerging racism towards Asian people um, when the pandemic first surfaced those years ago. What are we at now? Three years, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I worry that this could be a way of sort of targeting China as, as being something nasty and, and kind of them and us. I don't think it's particularly useful. If we had scientific proof that we needed to do this to keep us safe, yeah. But in fact, the proof isn't there. And this is not my opinion alone. There's many, many scientific people that don't think that pre-departure testing is the way to go. So I see it as quite political and I don't think it pulls us together. And if there's one area where we've really failed in this pandemic and Canada's generally done fairly well, but globally, we really haven't. And, and you know, all of us together, we really haven't united globally to fight this pandemic. We've really done our own things and look very inward with this. And I don't think that's good for any of us. Mm -hmm. So within Canada then, what can people do to protect themselves, not only against this new variant, but all the other strains as well? Well, you know, wearing masks and keeping up date with vaccines and looking to our families and asking the question, who amongst our families is vulnerable? Um, many of us, not all of us, but have elderly people within our families. And are they protected? Are they as safe as they could be? And, and you know, what else can we do to protect them? But, you know, what, what really what's happened is, is pandemics kind of have two ways of ending. And this pandemic has not ended. So, you know, has it ended biologically? No. Has it ended socially? Well, a lot of Canadians are so sick of it that we're now acting as if the pandemic's over. Um, and, you know, people have kind of moved on. And I, I don't think we need to worry and be anxious, but I do think for the safety and well-being of vulnerable people, it, it makes a lot of sense to mask, 
you know, not everywhere, perhaps. I, I don't mean walking down the street, although some people are comfortable doing that and that's fine, but in closed environments, et cetera, and to stay up to date with, with our vaccines and to make sure our most vulnerable people, particularly the elderly, are protected. Mm -hmm. Now, a poll for a media outlet found that many Canadians say that they are less likely to get a vaccination, uh, less likely to get vaccinated compared to when the pandemic started three years ago. And this is including any boosters. At this point, it's a little up in the air. Should we take another shot, whether it's a vaccination or a booster or not? Well, I mean, it depends on the person, you know, and I, I'm not going to tell people what they need to do and what they should do. But I mean, generally, we have to make sure that we're up to date on these things. What, what has happened is, is when the public begins to realize that the threat to the average person, non-vulnerable, is not what it used to be, um, people begin to step back from that. But I, I, you re really need to follow the public health guidance that we're seeing nationally. And, it, and it's not identical for everybody, but it is good to stay on top of these things. And, you know, it's not just us individually. Our nation needs to do more in terms of testing. You know, we criticized China, they gave up and they kind of did and they did it very, very quickly. Um, and I, you know, not such a great idea, but we've kind of given up too. I mean, we're not doing that much testing. We don't fully understand what we're up against now. We too are really not on top of the, of the pandemic the way we once were. I want to pick up on something that you mentioned before. You said that globally, Canada is not doing enough to address the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. What should Canada be doing then, or what do you recommend that we should do? Well, some of this is past tense, right, in, in which earlier in the pandemic. So, so some of the people watching may remember COVAX, which is a global vaccine sharing program. You know, we, Canada, as a high-income country, actually took vaccines out of that program in the early stages. And we never really came across with the amount of sharing with lower-income countries uh, that we could have. We, we, we really didn't do that. And there was quite a gap between the way we presented ourselves and what we really did. And, you know, it's not just Canada. I think international cooperation was, was very poor. I was in Yemen during the pandemic or, or during the more serious aspects of the pandemic, and they had less than 3%, 3% of their population vaccinated. You know, there was huge gaps all over the world in this. And I, I actually think we as Canadians, as a high income country, could have been doing a lot more. Mm -hmm. So you said that this is past tense, but it's possible that we well, could Well, not all of it's past now. tense. The worst of it's past tense. Some of it's present tense. Because look, let, let me bring you up to speed. Just a few months ago, we're hearing about the massive amount of vaccines that we're likely going to be throwing out, right? So did that really have to happen? Um, and, you know, I'm hoping the worst of the pandemic's over. We're all hoping the worst of the pandemic's over. But there's no one out there that can tell you exactly what is next with that, this pandemic because we don't know. So let's hope the worst is over. And mm -hmm. I think it probably is, but I don't know. And no mm -hmm. one does. So, you know, we, we really have to. And, you know, with, with the pandemic, you know, our minds need to go beyond just our own safety. We really have to think about other people in this. Of course, we have to think about our families, but we also have to think about, you know, other people in the world and vulnerable people. That's what's most important. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much, Carrie, for joining us today and sharing more about the latest of COVID-19 updates in the country. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. You are watching Canadian Muslim News on Muslim Network TV. That's it from our Toronto studios tonight. Make sure to like, share and subscribe to our channel for more Canadian Muslim content. Stay safe and until next time.